So can you hear me okay out there? Good afternoon, I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Massasoit Conference Center for our 27th Annual Small Business and Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. Today's program is sponsored by Bank of America. Bank of America started out in 1904 serving a specific market, market segment. It was uh, immigrants from Italy in San Francisco that were being denied service at existing banks in that area. From that humble start, they now serve 49 million customers and offer industry-leading support to three million small business owners through an innovative suite of award-winning online products and services. We are happy for their success and for their sponsorship and support uh, of Bank America today, and uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Just as an aside for you beer drinkers who like to keep your beer cold, they have koozies here at their display table. <laughs> And they also have uh, quite a few little items, so uh, don't miss their display table up here and talk to some of the uh, reps from Bank of America. You'll notice, notice in the center of each table is a four-pack of Shoveltown beer. Many of you may have noticed it. I saw people picking it up and admiring it. And an envelope containing a complimentary gift certificate for just desserts, bakery and cafe. These represent our award honorees and our courtesy of our sponsor, Bank of America. If you could all look under your plate, now your plates are to your left, your, your bread plates, uh, right now, the person with a logo marker for either Shoveltown or Just Desserts gets to take home the associated door prize. So you can figure that out now. <laughs> and maybe the two winners could... Uh, to get together and have uh, a Madagascar vanilla. Let's get some networking going. I like that beer and beer and cake. So we, we do expect some additional people in. If you have an empty seat at your table, please welcome someone if they're looking uh, as the program begins. And now, please join me in a moment of silence in memory of all our U.S. servicemen and women serving throughout the world today. Thank you very much. At this time, I encourage you to enjoy this wonderful lunch as we begin speaking a uh, portion of the program. So finish your uh, salads, and then uh, the servers will come out with the uh, lunches. We'll continue on with our program. In uh, 1963, President John F. Kennedy created National Sp Small Business Week to honor small business owners and recognize the value of small businesses and what they bring to America. Today, Small Business Week has evolved into Small Business Month, which affords us a more opportunity to honor those individuals whose impact extends far beyond their reach, touching the lives of their peers, their families, their successors, and inspiring minds of budding entrepreneurs everywhere. Today's recipients will join a long list of triumphant business people and entrepreneurs who use their ingenuity to adapt to changing economic and social climates to not only survive, but thrive and build our local economy. We hope that any budding entrepreneurs in the audience today are inspired to take the leap of faith and live your dream. With a stronger economy, open markets, tremendous recent investment in the region, and accessible financing available, now truly is the time to take a chance and open a business. When I think about our region and our business climate, I am amazed at all at, at all we have to offer visitors, investors, and innovative companies throughout the region. On each of your tables, you'll also find hot off the press is the newest Chamber of Commerce book for business. It's right in the center there. This book contains information on all member businesses, but also some interesting demographics about our area. In fact, uh, this might be interesting to some of you who are in the audience and, and are perusing the book. Did you know that there are seven nationally branded hotels uh, in Brockton, totaling more than 500 hotel rooms, generating over $650,000 in local rooms tax to the city of Brockton? Uh, try to name those if you can. Many people don't realize it's that many. Or that the commercial tax rate is one of the lowest in the region is in Easton at 1621 per thousand of assessed value. That information is also in there for all the towns we serve. There are also 27 industrial parks listed within the region, and they're all in that book with contact names and facilities and uh, amenities that are offered there. 
In that book, there are also 40 parks and recreational sites located within the region, including more than 800 acres of open, open space in Brockton alone, as well as four golf courses just within the city limits of Brockton. That's pretty amazing. Most people don't realize there's this four golf courses right here. And there's another uh, 12 in the region of Metro South. We are very fortunate to have so much to enjoy and also to offer our visitors who come here to the Metro South from all over. We are also fortunate to have Emma, Emma Stratton, who just started with us and just graduated from Bridgewater State University. She created this book this year and did a wonderful job. I think we should have a, a round of applause for Emma. More than 4,500 copies of these were mailed out to businesses throughout the area. Uh, another 500 are distributed throughout the hotels in the region. And uh, there are still more available here today and then in the office. If you'd like some for relocating uh, business people or employees or just for your office, let us know and we can get you a supply. It is now my pleasure to welcome our MC this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming the Chairman of the Chamber's Board of Directors, Jerry Nadeau, President of Rockland Trust. Jerry. Good afternoon. It's an honor to participate in this very special event. I think I've been attending this event now for over 20 years, and every year I look forward to it, to learning about new businesses, new ideas, new enthusiasm. So I think it's, it may be if you all would join me in a round of applause for every business owner in, we have in joining in our market. There are currently over 28 million small businesses in the United States. There are only th over 350 million people in the whole country, so think about that. Small businesses are the backbone. They provide over 60 to 80 percent of all new jobs every year. Small businesses allow communities to gain higher tax revenue, which in turn is used to improve our cities and towns. Small businesses also work at the micro level of our economy, employing workers, banking at local financial institutions, thank you very much, and sourcing products locally. The Metro South Chamber supports small businesses entrepreneurship by providing top-notch programming, advocacy, and consultation. Just last week, the Chamber hosted a supplier diversity certification workshop attended by more than 50 small, diverse businesses. Our Chamber's ambassadors represent the Chamber in community events embodying the meaning of ambassador. Let's take a moment to acknowledge our ambassadors who are in attendance today. They are Ambassador Chair Joanne Schneider, Eastern Bank. Brenda, Brenda Karens, Old Colony Elder Services. Miney Dutton, Connemara Senior Living Campello. Richard Hook, Crescent Credit Union. Catherine Light, Mansfield Bank. There is. Ryko O'Neill, Bridgewater Savings. And last, Murray Vetstein, Source 4. We also have with us some elected officials who recognize the importance of small business within their communities. First, we have Brockton City Council Ian Beauregard and Councilor Jack Lally. We have Mark Lindy to my left, Southeastern Regional School Committee. And Dan Salvucci, Whitman Select Person. Now I'd like to introduce our sponsor for today's event, Paul Agnetti from Bank of America, who will update us on what's happening with our special guest. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Jerry. I am Paul Anganetti. I am the market executive for business banking in Southeastern Mass for Bank of America. Proud to say I've been with the bank 30 years, one, one place, one bank. Uh, I, uh, I, I can tell you that from my perspective, this is one of the marquee events that the chamber uh, sponsors and, and hosts. We have been sponsoring this event 
for now somewhere over 20 plus years. It's a real pride and joy for us. Uh, any opportunity we have to celebrate, recognize outstanding business owners, outstanding businesses and leadership is a real privilege. Uh, today, uh, we are uh, uh, joined by a very special guest speaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce Erin Moran McCormick. This is a very impressive bio. Erin Moran McCormick is an entrepreneur, educator, techie, award-winning designer, and author. She helps transform people and organizations by creating programs that, de that develop confident, innovative and engaged employees and entrepreneurs that get results. She works with executives, emerging leaders, entrepreneurs, and students from around the world to develop their entrepreneurial mindset and to teach them how to turn ideas and fears into action. Erin is the founder of Year of Action and director of the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at UMass Boston, where her focus is on advancing women and people of color. She started three companies, been CIO twice, and was the former director of curriculum innovation and technology at Babson College. Erin is the author of Year of Action, How to Stop Waiting and Start Living Your Big Fabulous Life, Adventures Advice and Action Steps to Create the Life You Want. Her new book, Launching Your Life, How to Use the Business Principles of Entrepreneurship to Launch a Life You Love. Erin, what do you do in your spare time? Erin <laughs> is a featured speaker at Fortune 500 companies who hire Erin to inspire their employees to dream big, set lofty goals, and learn how to take action for amazing results. On your tables, you have cards uh, at the end of her remarks. There'll be an opportunity to ask some questions. Please, uh, as she's speaking, consider a question for Aaron. You can put it down on your card, and, and then Jerry will, uh, will handle the question. Aaron, great pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you. Wow, that's a big introduction to live up to. Thank you, Paul. And Emma, who they just mentioned was new here, is my tech help. So hopefully we will have our technology running quickly. Let me just get this together. This is where I should learn a few jokes. Oh, nice. Let's see. Hold on one second. Let's see if this works. All right, so today I'm going to go back for a second. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk about uh, sort of lessons learned, and I want to give you some practical action steps. This is one of my classes at uh, UMass Boston when we were doing our finals. I had them pitch their business ideas to real business members of the community. So I want to ask you a few questions, right? So first, do you ever feel like you want more, but you're not quite sure what that is or where to start? Or do you ever feel like you're working hard but not making that impact or income you really could be making? Ever feel like you're running around but you're not getting anywhere? Or you're afraid to go after that big dream or what you really want or that next level? Or do you ever feel like you're going it alone? Any of that register with you guys? <laughs> well, the good news is, you know, you're not alone. I hear those questions all the time from talking with small business owners to executives. And so what I wanted to do tonight, it's hard, Chris asked me to, you know, have 20 minutes, which is hard for someone who loves to talk. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of give you some nuggets of new perspectives and mindset to help you with some of those questions, as well as have you take a look at kind of what's holding you back and give you some practical tools to help you overcome some of these roadblocks and do it on time. So let's see how I do. <laughs> and so one of the reasons, I and I'm talking with companies all over, it's really about needing to shake things up and there are new rules for this innovation economy. I met some amazing bankers while I'm out there and we're talking about, well, we don't really necessarily want to innovate. And part of what I want to do is saying, 
you know, you can keep doing what you're doing, but also keep an eye on new perspective. What else is going on out there? So I want to talk with three mistakes I see all the time with entrepreneurs and hopefully help you, if you especially if you're just starting out a business, so you can avoid some of these mistakes. And what you find, sort of, one of the first mistakes I see is sort of, you may have heard sort of that shiny object syndrome, right? Where you're bouncing from idea to idea. Oh, we're going to start this. We're going to do that. And you never really have that opportunity to focus on bring, in bringing one thing to life. It's sort of on the flip side of that, the second would be, I see entrepreneurs all the time who fall in love with their idea, right? They're sitting in their garage or their dining room table and they're creating this business idea that they just think the world is going to love and they have fallen in love with it and they almost blindsided by saying, well, how are you going to make any money with this, right? So they've fallen in love with their idea and what I try to help entrepreneurs say, I want you to fall in love with finding a solution and that your idea may change, fall in love with the solution. And how I teach my students is I, you want to think about it versus a toothache versus a vitamin. Right? So if you have ever had a toothache, <laughs> you know, you are in pain. If someone came up to you and said, hey, for 500 bucks, I'll fix it, whether it's 100, 500, 1,000, whatever it is, I'll take it. Right? You are in pain. You're searching for a solution. I will pay for you to fix this versus a vitamin, right? You've got vitamins on the shelf. You're supposed to take them. They're good for you. I know I should do this. You forget your vitamins, maybe they run out. And so you've kind of, you, you, they're not as important. You're not necessarily searching for the vitamin provider. And what you're, as entrepreneurs, you want to find the businesses that have the toothaches. Who is in pain? Who has a problem? Who is searching for a solution and is willing to pay for that solution and find those toothache companies? And it's, so many people think it's about the idea, and it's about not starting with the idea, but it's learning how to take that step back and really see problems as opportunities and then solve for them. And so how do you know where the problems are, right? You start listening and paying attention. People say, oh, it's such a headache or it's so aggravating. Man, this project, it's such a pain, a challenge. I'm so frustrated. We have so many issues with this. It's wasting so much time and money. I wish, or this is gold to an entrepreneur. When you start hearing this, your ears should perk up and say, what could I do to help solve some of these things? And so entrepreneurs aren't so much as these you know, big risk takers and jumping off cliffs, big adventure seekers, as much as they're, they're really a bottle of aspirin. <laughs> and so entrepreneurs really are looking for the headaches and figuring out how to take away the pain. And so it's about seeing problems as opportunity. Because just ask me, I'm a chicken. I'm afraid, you know, my kids would say, my mom would never be this crazy risk taker. I'm a problem solver. I'm really good at seeing problems from a new perspective and helping to come up with solutions. Wanted to tell you a little bit about a project I did down in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where I worked in the favelas of Sao Paulo with these kids who were teaching them how to start a business. They had no you know, no business background, no money. These guys don't have any internet and very little hope for this bright future. And we looked at entrepreneurship as a ticket out, as a way for them to really have some hope. And within the 10 weeks of the program, the students had developed 12 business plans. They had presented to executives at Barclays Bank who had gotten a grant from for this project. And three of them got funding within that time frames to start their business. And these guys had nothing to start with. I don't speak Portuguese. I did a lot of the training from Boston. And I, one of the reasons I went to UMass Boston was I thought, if I can do this in Brazil, why can't I do this here in helping these students? One of the guys, he lived in these favelas. And they had, he said, what, you know, they started by saying, oh, we're going to solve the water problem in Brazil. Well, I mean, that would be great. But what if you started more closely at home? What's a problem that's going on now in your area? And they said, well, we can't get anywhere. There's no transportation. So the cabs and Ubers are too afraid to drive into the favelas. But they're not afraid. They live there. So we worked with them to say, why don't you talk to a van company, and you could give a percentage or lease the van. You don't have to invest in trying to buy a car. You get this van, and then you could be the cab driver or the Uber in your favela. And that became a company for him. 
That became his ticket out. Or a mom who said, there's no place for me to get a hot, hot breakfast for my kids before they go off to school. And so there was space in the lobby of where she lived, and we helped her talk to the landlord and said, what if you start a mini bakery here in the lobby? You can make your great hot sandwiches that you have for your kids. It gave the value of the building, that the increase went up. She didn't have to go and buy a big bakery, and she could start her business. And so part of what we're teaching is, as your business owner, you sort of take a step back and say, well, where are you now? Where do you want to go? And how are you going to get there using what you have, right? It's sort of looking around, seeing your resources, and taking it from there. Now, mistake number three I see a lot, right? Thinking busy means productive, right? And so it's about, oh, I'm running a business. I have to be, you know, my hair's on fire. I'm running around all the time. You know, how many of you have, you know, this, this, this email box had, you know, 16,000 emails, right? So emails, these long lists, right? You write on a to-do list 85 things you have to do this week, only to copy over 85 things next week, none of which get done. Or how many of you have written something after it's been done just so you can cross it off your to-do list, right? Because, man, it feels good to get stuff done. Well, so this way of like, always on, 24-7 working isn't working. And so I think we need a new way, right? So you're never as organized as you are the day before vacation, right? You know what you have to do, what has to get done, you're clear, you're focused, because, man, you are getting on that plane tomorrow, right? And so how do you take that mindset, that sort of day before vacation mindset, and incorporate it into your everyday so that you're very clear on what you need to be working on? And so this combination of mindset and tools where, you know, what are the goals? Are they clear what you should be working on? And now, especially with this new economy, it's much more results driven. Here's the goal, it's due on Tuesday. You know, you can work around the hours that make sense for you. How can we be more flexible in allowing the goals to be reached with a new perspective? I see this a lot, I come out of technology with my developers, right? It was like, hey, this code is due on Tuesday. If you want to work at 10 o'clock at night, I don't care, but if it's not done on Tuesday, we have a problem. And so being clear on the goals, being clear on what the results are needed, and allowing for that flexibility, and I want to talk about meetings. <laughs> and go, okay. I'll go into that. In all of this, you might say, well, that's all great. When am I going to have time for this? 15 minutes is this sort of magic number. So again, I come out of technology and we would do a lot with sprints, sort of agile development where you've got one thing to work on and your head's down, you're focused for an hour, a week, two weeks, getting this thing done, running this sprint, being focused on the work to do. And so what you could do now is I have people say, well, that would be great, but I don't have the luxury of focusing. And so I said, well, you have 15 minutes. So I have my students set their phone for 15 minutes turn off the bell on your email, shut your door, and be focused on accomplishing this one task for 15 minutes. You'll be amazed the amount of work you can get done, and then you can expand that. Or I have my kids do this, hey, you gotta go clean your room for 15 minutes, and don't think not doing it allows you to be done. If it's not done, you get another 15, right? But in 15 minutes, amazing things can happen when you have that focus. In addition, I have them take 15 minutes on Monday morning and they fill out a weekly action plan. I have this workbook that says what's important this week, sort of that day before vacation mentality. What has to get done this week? What are your key goals? And you set it, it takes 15 minutes to do it, and you'll be amazed to see what you're working on and how, how much you can get done. And then at the end of the week, you take 15 minutes, end of the day Friday, and you make a few bullet points about what you did this week. Are there things you're stuck on? I do a lot with time management. Where did you spend your time? If you have a big project and you didn't get to spend any time on that, what could we change? And again, there's short, small segments, 15 minutes, amazing things can happen. The nice thing, too, is you can um, use those for your review. You just collect all your weekly bullet points, and then your boss says, what did you do this year? You have those already made. I have this on my website, yearofaction.com get more done, so it's free uh, worksheets and explanation, explanation of how it works. If you want to go uh, do that, it will show you how it works, but each column is a big project you're working on. So I'm not married to this system, but I'm married to a system. So you need something to be clear about what's important, what are you working on, and how do you make it happen. But I think you're going to love it because my students 
go crazy for this. Um, a big thing I wanted to bring up with all these great business people in the room is talking about meetings and more effective meetings. And especially this diversity of thought is a competitive advantage today. And you hear a lot about trying to get a more diverse, a more diverse board so you can get that thought. I do a lot with women who are trying to get a seat at the table, but what I'm hearing is, you know, we've helped them kind of get the seat, we've helped them speak up, and what I'm still hearing is I'm speaking up and nobody's listening. So I'll say something and then like a few minutes later, Joe says something and they're like, Joe, great idea. And you're like, uh, I just said that. And so with these great business people in the room, you have the power to help really change this dynamic and be thinking about your meetings. So first I have people, Set ground rules. And so, an easy one, right? A no interruption policy. You set the ground rules, and then when someone interrupts, you just say, hey, one at a time, or you know, let her finish, right? So you, as the meeting facilitator, can really make great things happen. Be present, right? So everyone's on their phone or on their laptop and not really listening. And so if you say, hey, put down the phone, we're gonna start on time. Two o'clock means two o'clock, and pay attention your meetings are gonna be much more effective and productive and people will be present. If you can start establishing this as a safe space where people can be open and bring up new ideas and respect each other and not the, oh, we tried that already, that doesn't work, oh, you're the new kid, what do you know? I was always the new kid, art and psych major who was at the technology table saying, well, how do you turn it on? And they're like, oh, well, you reach behind and I said, well, how would anybody know that? And so I just became great at speaking up, and I became CIO. <laughs> and so part of it is having that, having that safe space to be able to, to bring up these new ideas. And let people know that silence implies consensus. So the time to speak up is now, not after the meeting when you're gonna second guess or you know, undermine it. It's a safe space, bring up your ideas now, and, and talk about these things. This is how innovation happens. It starts at these meeting tables. Again, we're talking about as a facilitator, um, you know, you can, I hear a lot about, you know, sort of the senior person in the room kind of takes over the meeting, right? They're going on and on about this thing and no one else gets a chance to talk. So you, as the person running the meeting, needs to kind of take a step back, understand this, and say, hey, you know, I'm picking on Joe. Thanks, Joe, I'm gonna stop you there. Let's hear from a few others. Or for those who I, who I hear a lot, you know, they kind of shut down, you know, call them out. Hey, Jane, this is your area of expertise. How is this going to impact your group? What do we need to know? And really start pulling it out, getting that diversity of thought because it is a competitive advantage. Calling on those who've been quiet. And also, another thing is take a look at the type and timing of your meetings. Right, so we would do lots of stand-ups, right? It, why do you have to sit for an hour around a table? Maybe it's a 20-minute meeting. Well, this is a big one, right? Why not start at 10 past the hour? Because you have meetings from 10 to 11, and then 11 to 12, so now you're late for your 11 o'clock, and everyone else is late, and they start at 11.15, and you know, so the, the way you could do this is take a meeting inventory and assessment, right? Look at all those meetings you're going to. When I have my students and executives take a time assessment, their day is full of email and meetings. So it's five o'clock and they're like, I haven't done any work. I just answered emails and, and went to meetings. And so how are you supposed to get anything done? So this was a big one. If you can start looking at your meetings, take a fresh perspective and say, you know, do we really need to meet? If you're doing a lot of status updates, couldn't I just write a paragraph and send that around to everybody? Or, you know, is there technology that could help us uh, communicate better? Or what's the purpose of this meeting? Are we actually just deciding something or are we just getting everybody to give a status update? Is it effective? What's happening here? And so another cheat sheet for you guys, it's year of action slash meetings. I have this cheat sheet, I have a way to use it. Again, I'm not married to this, but I'm married to something. Take a look at how you're meeting, take a look at if, if they're effective or what you could do. And I think you're gonna, you're gonna thank me for this. So we had these three mistakes, right? Shiny objects, falling in love with your idea, and thinking that busy means productive. So let's say you're not doing those or you fix these mistakes. So what now is kind of holding you back? So lizards. <laughs> so the lizard brain, scientists in the room, right? The amygdala or the reptilian brain is an actual part of your brain. 
it was back in prehistoric times, it's all the lizard had, this little part of the brain, sort of that fight or flight, right? It's that fear. So if a saber-toothed tiger was running after you, the lizard said, go, right? That part of your brain said, run. And so we need that. You need that to keep you safe so you don't run out into traffic, but it can't distinguish between levels of fear. So this lizard brain is that same thing as, ah, don't speak up in class, you know, don't give a speech, don't, you know, put yourself out there. But the good thing is when that little voice starts coming in, it starts saying, oh, don't do that. How are you going to start a business? How are you going to ask for that promotion? As that's coming up, as you're starting to hear that voice, if you can start to embrace that lizard brain, right, and say, okay, I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I must be on to something. And the cool thing is that small steps start quieting that lizard brain. And I, I brought some for anybody here. So I, when I do longer speeches, when people ask questions, I give everybody a lizard and I make everybody get one by the time we're done. But, and then you can carry these in your pocket. So when you're afraid, you just you know, hold on to your lizard. And you may have seen, I've got a little lizard I bought from a women entrepreneur. Uh, and so again, it's just that, that uh, remembering that that voice, right, you can push past that fear. So we learned that it's not just about the idea, that's just a piece of the puzzle. So often you might, you know, you love your idea and then you're great at it, but what happens is the piece, right, that now you're being, gonna ask people to pay for this, or you're gonna see, hey, does the world need this? That's when that lizard brain can come in, right? So, you know, how do you know if the world needs this idea or this business? You gotta ask them, right? Or, I teach this too, sell first. So a lot of sort of these lean startup principles where build, measure, learn. I just, I'm teaching a class in China online. So this morning at 6.30, I taught a bunch of entrepreneurs in China about this. They've just created their idea and now they have to go talk to people. And this is when the lizard brain comes out full force. Like, well, you mean like talk to real people? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and ask them, hey, here's my idea. What do you think? And you don't want to be so married to it that you can't accept their feedback. Often entrepreneurs get so far down the road that they're so in love with their idea, they do the yeah, but. Oh, that wouldn't work. You know, yeah, but it's going to be great. Or yeah, but I'm going to make money. I'm like, no, you have to ask and sell first so that you can take their feedback and actually build what they want. And it's about talking to potential customers before you spend a lot of time. Like, don't buy all this inventory before you've asked anybody, hey, would you buy this thing? I see so many entrepreneurs who've invested all this up front and have never talked to a customer. And I say, hey, imagine this thing was already done. Now what would you do? Who would you talk to? Go talk to them now. Let's see what they say, and let's use their feedback to change that. And this can be a place whether you're an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur. They talk about being innovative within a business. So if you have a new product coming out, before you invest a ton, go talk to people. Build, build a rapid prototype, build a little version of it, and go and show it around and see what people say. And learn from that and make a better product. Because it's not what you want, it's what your customer wants. So I'll give you an example. So how do you do all this? So I've come up, I call this developing this entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, I'll give you an example. So you start with C, right? See the opportunities, uh, open your eyes and ears to those, what we call challenges, right, as, as new opportunities. So I had seen a challenge. It was an opportunity for me to find new work, find a new job. Um, and so I didn't know what I was gonna do, and I was the main breadwinner, mother of two. And so I was like, well, gosh, what am I gonna do? And so you start with the C. I knew I needed to leave. Um, and then you move to believe. Believe in the possibility. This is where most people get stuck. This is the what if stage. You don't have to know how you're gonna do it at this point. You just have to believe that it's possible. And we talk about the details later. It's about dream big, right? And the key is you have to write it down. So there's a part of the brain, it's called the RAS, reticular activating system. It's the filter in your brain. Right, so you're bombarded with things all the time. This part of the brain, the process of actually writing pen to paper, gets that into this filter and it says, hey, pay attention. Anything that, this must be important. Anything that's gonna help you with this, I'm gonna take notice of. You may hear yourself, oh, I was thinking about it and then things started popping up, right? So it's important not just to think about it or type it into keyboard, actually write it down. That process tells the brain to pay attention. So for me, I write down crazy big dreams, right? I'm gonna create a new kind of university. I am gonna write a book, 
and I am going to have a big job and a flexible schedule. And I have no idea how I'm going to do any of that. I just have to believe in the possibility. My husband's like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I'm sitting in the Medfield Public Library, where I'm from, and I am surrounded by all these books. And I looked around and I thought, well, wait a minute. All those authors had to start somewhere, right? They started. I said, I'm smart. Look, you know, I could figure that out. Again, no idea how to write a book, just believing in the possibility. And then the third step is act. Take a step. What is one thing you could do towards that goal? So I bought myself a Mac, sat at my dining room table, and wrote Year of Action by Erin Moran McCormick. I am an author. <laughs> it was that mindset. It wasn't that I had left my job. You know, they're like, oh, you're going to be OK. And they're like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm writing a book. Oh, you're writing a book. Right? I'm still unemployed, still have no idea how to do this. But I just took that step, right? See, believe, act. So here's what big dreams look like, right? It is hard work. So I would get up at 4.30 in the morning because I couldn't wait to start writing and before the kids got up and I had some time and it's messy and it's holidays and all that stuff, it is hard work. And so people see the end of it. They see me, I was around the world and I'm on TV and all these cool things and these book parties and they're like, oh, well, you could do that. You know, I could never do that, that lizard brain, right? I'm not X enough. I don't have the right degree. I don't have the right blah. It's all about the steps. It's not magic, it's momentum, right? See the moment, believe in the possibility, take a step, and then another one. And you can apply this entrepreneurial mindset to a variety of things. See, believe, act. It's simple, but it's not easy. But using this formula, I have helped people start companies and executives get those promotions. And it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. But it works. And a lot of it stems from pushing past that lizard brain. Because you want to get the, your time right and your goals right. You want to have this time so that you can live now in this what if possibility mindset. With what's happening in the world, you need to be able to take that step back and look at things from new perspectives. We talked about. It's called educated incapacity. When you know something so well, you can no longer see it with fresh eyes, right? So you, it needs somebody new coming into your industry. All that jargon you use or all those things you take for granted or your brain does start taking shortcuts and you're physically not able to see things in the way someone else can see it. And so you need to get yourself to this what if possibility mindset to advance and not be disrupted out of business. And so if you ask yourself things like, okay, what if, what if your largest customer disappeared tonight, right? What if you could, your brick and mortar, what if you could only interact with people online? What if you could only serve one segment of the market? What if you had to move from a business to consumer to a business to business model? What if the price of your product is suddenly cut in half for market demand? Or what if you have to suddenly offer this tenfold premium version of your product? Or what if you didn't have to spend so much time doing X? Or what if people no longer had to do Y, right? So you're looking at all these companies that have been the leader, you know, the blockbusters of the world. What happens if things change? What are you going to do about it? And you have to allow yourself to get into this what if possibility mindset so that new big dreams can start to take place. And so I've tried to do quickly, I see how we did, um, but coming up with kind of this new perspective, new mindset, so that you can be more successful and you can feel more fulfilled in doing the work that you love doing. I'm going to do a quick summary here, right? So we talked quickly, this is my mad dash of Developing this entrepreneurial mindset, whether or not you're starting your own business or innovating within an organization. C, see things from a new perspective. Believe in that possibility. Get yourself in that what if. Stream of consciousness, right? Who am, it all of those came through. I've created a new kind of university. I have a flexible schedule, and I've written three books. So it's all about following this simple model, that dream big. And then act. What's one thing you could do? Or where you're stuck, why are you stuck? What's one thing you could do to get past that roadblock? So it's starting with the problem, not the idea. 
you want those toothache problems that you can solve that people would you know, love to pay you for versus a vitamin company. And you want to ask and sell first. Remember our friend the lizard, right? What's holding you back? How do you push past that lizard brain? And really, it's, it's things people talk about but don't really do. You need to get ahead of your time, right? Figuring out where your goals are, spending 15 minutes, hey, what am I doing this week? What am I going to work on today for 15 minutes? At the end of the week, what did I do? Where do I need to make adjustments? More effective meetings. It's a great takeaway. You can start right now. I think it's going to make a world of difference, and you'll start seeing new ideas come up. Those who have great ideas but were afraid to speak, they're going to start speaking. You really need that diversity at your table. These yearofaction.com, you can get these worksheets. I think I brought some workbooks if people want those. I also do workshops if anyone's interested. I'd love to hear from you. I celebrate all the great businesses out there. Thank you so much for the honor of being here today. Thank you very much. Jerry. I think we have a, we're gonna right over oh, here. Okay. And if you have a seat, if you would, on the left. I would start saying, okay, if I had a new perspective on this, uh, what would I do? 
and get some millennials in there and get people who know nothing about banking and start saying, hey, what would you wish for? I see a ton happening with healthcare. And I do a lot with healthcare and what's happening both for the whole experience of going through the healthcare system as well as actually um, bringing new drugs to market and how that all works. So those industries that you wouldn't naturally think of, you know, like finance or education or health, I just see so much activity going on now. And people might think, oh, they can't touch our business. And I say, it's every business. And so, you know, if you say, oh, we're not really entrepreneurial in our company. Everyone needs to be entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial. And if you're not, someone else is thinking about how they could improve your business. So, you know, start paying attention. Thank you. And it's interesting, you brought back a memory of a session that I went to over 25 years ago when we talked about focusing on either asking about selling your product. So, this is, I think it was 50, 30, nearly 30 years ago, I attended a presentation put on by Jim Cook. Oh, I was at a with him, yeah. And he told a story about, you know, he sat down with his father at the end of the day and he was sharing with him all the time he had spent that afternoon working on his technology at the time, which was different than today, and his bookkeeping and accounting systems. He went on, he'd been great, quite proud of yeah. describing all that to his father. And his father said, that's great, how many customers did you call on today? And he said, well, they call anyone. He said, wasn't the sales matter first? I don't know if you that, yeah. as long as yeah. I, you said it as well today. Oh, this could be tough. Okay. So what one piece of advice would you give a prospective business owner when they're starting up? That's tough. That is. I see them all the time. So I have a lot of advice. The, um, so I guess, so it's, I took that out of one of the mistakes, but I think one of the other big mistakes people hear is, oh, follow your passion and the, the, the money's going to magically appear. Well, so I like to change that to say, forget follow your passion. But all about being passionate about the work you're doing, it's about finding work you can be passionate about. Excuse the grammar. But <laughs> if you can, it's not about saying, you know, if you love yoga, you're gonna open a yoga studio. Because you're gonna spend so much time looking for customers and paying the bills and finding studio space and no time in downward dog, right? And so you may end up presenting what you once loved. And so if you're gonna be starting a business, you need to love running a business. And it's not necessarily about that. I think that's a disservice for people saying, oh, just follow your passion, everything else will work out on its own, coupled with the whole sell first. We talk about one of the biggest reasons companies fail, fail is because they forget to figure in their customer acquisition costs. You know, build it, they will come. And, oh, it's gonna be this great thing, and I'm so in love with it, and who wouldn't buy this? And they ask their mom and their best friends, and, oh, honey, you're so smart, and yes, we're gonna buy your product. I was like, well, you need to talk to people who don't know you, who don't love you, what do they think? And how much is it gonna cost for you to find them and convert them? And so sort of that, find work you can be passionate about, but also consider the business side. How are you gonna make money, and how are you gonna find customers? You need both of those to succeed. Certainly do. <clears throat> Glasses. This is the opportunity. I got contacts that allow me not to have glasses. Yeah, I'm sure the Ocean State's finest. <laughs> Those of you that know me are well aware of that. So, so, can you tell me about the business that you host that you can ask? Thank you, Ben. So, so, UMass is cool. They have considered sort of partners. So, I'm on the academic side. So, I teach uh, seniors and grad students and help them sort of bring their ideas to life. And then there's an amazing group, it's called the BDC, the Venture Development Center. It's kind of like a Google space, it's very cool. And students from Harvard, MIT, all kinds of uh, students have to apply to get into the BDC. And so we work hand in hand and help uh, bring these ideas to life. And they're doing a ton in healthcare. Um, stuff I don't have any idea what it means, other than it's really cool, and we're doing stuff with cancer, and I was like, wow, you guys are really smart. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so there's a lot in sort of the health field, uh, sciences, biotech, uh, to be in, in your right in with all the hospitals. So there's amazing work that's happening there, as well as the smaller ones. When I was first going to UMass, I said, you know, it's not, I'm not going to be teaching a lot about sort of uh, trying to pitch to venture capitals. My students are scrappy and they have to figure out how to make do. And so things like 
um, you know, guys starting you know food trucks, or um, uh, one guy just from Vietnam is starting uh, cocoa water, like you know coconut water. And so a lot of product-based businesses that you know using what you have, right? Okay, what do we have to do? I set them up with people that could help them. And so it's a lot of the small product type uh, companies. So hand in hand, we have both sort of the cool big, you know, pie in the sky initiatives as well as I gotta make some money fast. How can we turn this into a business? That's great. Well, listen, why don't we all join me a round of applause for Aaron? Thank you. Now, while we were uh, just sitting down to eat, uh, Mayor Bill Carpenter was able to join us, which we're thrilled with. And if you would so indulge me, allow me to give a little bit of background on Bill. Someone who I guess I've known, uh, Bill and I have known each other for, uh, I guess, almost 25 years, I guess, Bill, since our kids played hockey together growing up in Brockton. So, Bill Carpenter is a 32-year resident of Brockton, a father of six children. Previous to becoming mayor, he served four years as the Ward 5 representative to the Brockton School Committee, where he was chairman of the Facilities Usage Committee and a vocal advocate for combating substance abuse and addiction inside the school system. He is also the co-founder of the Independence Academy, the state's fourth recovery school and only the 43rd in the U.S., serving teenagers who are re-engaging their education while receiving treatment supports for substance abuse disorders. Bill is very active in the community. He's perhaps best well known as the radio voice of Brockton High Sports for 17 years and as a radio talk show host on BET First and then on WXBR. He was also widely known as a professional boxing ring announcer, having announced over 100 nationally televised fight cards. Bill has served as mayor of City Brockton for four years and is currently in his third term. Among many important accomplishments, his administration has established a new economic development team, increased investment in public safety, created new sources of revenue, updated the city's use of technology, and has increased diversity among city staff, as well as on the city boards and commissions. His administration has made substantial revitalization efforts that are attracting new investment and increased economic opportunity for both businesses and residents throughout the city. The mayor is recognized statewide as a leader in fighting the opiate crisis and was the only mayor selected by Governor Baker to serve in the governor's opioid addiction working group. During his second term, he created the Champion Plan, a police-assisted recovery program helping those with substance abuse disorders obtain addiction treatment. Mayor Carpenter has received national recognition for all these efforts to address the crisis and has presented its success before the 2016 National League of Cities Conferences. Bill, would you like to give us a few words? Well, Chris just informed me my time is up. I used it all on the introduction, I guess. <laughs> um, Aaron, I, I really uh, in, enjoyed the presentation, and I, I do have a small announcement I'm making this uh, today, this afternoon, and I think it actually ties in perfectly with uh, some of the things you spoke about. Um, although I do have to say that, you know, as mayor I've been accused of a lot of things, but running around with my hair on fire has never been one of them, so I guess I can eliminate that one. Um, we know it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. In terms of the City of Brockton's economic development plans and our our economic future, you know, small business is at the core of it. And we know that long term, most of our jobs are going to be created by small businesses. The growth in our tax base is going to be due to small business. Um, and that, you know, it's great when a large company comes to town and brings 100 jobs with it and everybody takes notice. But the fact of the matter is that the real work for us and where we're really going to have the success is by uh, supporting and helping to start and helping to grow and helping small businesses uh, to succeed. Um, so I thought that uh, today would be, uh, in terms of the Small Business Awards and recognition of uh, Small Business of the Year and Entrepreneur of the Year, uh, would give me a chance to uh, announce a new initiative here in the city of Brockton. Uh, 
we are creating a small business advisory board. Not another government agency, but simply a small group of uh, about five small business owners that will informally sit with me once a month uh, to talk about issues and challenges that impact small businesses here in the city. Um, I think that uh, quite often the small business owners feel as though they don't have a voice or they're not heard or perhaps some of the information I'm receiving, I'm receiving it filtered. And Aaron talked about in a meeting having a diversity of thought and that's exactly what the premise of this group is. One hour, once a month, in my office with the doors closed, no public, uh, no media, but simply an opportunity to speak openly and honestly and directly uh, about issues that impact business owners and primarily small business owners uh, here in the city. Uh, there will only just be, I'll, I'll point one other city official to sit with me and that will be it. And, and I believe that this can really create uh, improved communication, heightened awareness for us as city government to know where we're getting in the way so that we can start getting out of the way, where we can proactively be helping small businesses to succeed. And ironically, you know, I met with a, a small business owner uh, earlier this morning, and, you know, she, she the things that we don't always think about every day at City Hall. You know, she, she spoke about, you know, there's a bus stop right nearby and if we could get a trash barrel for the bus stop because everybody stands at the bus stop and throws their trash on the ground and that impacts the appearance of my business as people drive by. It, it, you know, things, now that may not seem like a big issue, but it's a big issue to that business owner. And it then also causes me to have a larger thought about do we need to be looking at this across the city as something that, that we should be taking a harder look at and addressing? So um, uh, the goal of this group is going to be to help small businesses start, help small businesses grow, but mostly to help handle fixable problems, things that we can fix that will make a difference to small business owners. So i would just going to take a moment to introduce who the members of uh, the Small Business Advisory uh, Board will be, and I hope that if you picture this group, uh, the diversity of thought that uh, Aaron uh, referenced will come through. Uh, so Jenny Mather, who is the owner-operator of JM Pet Resort, I think a former award winner here uh, with the Chamber of Commerce is going to be with us. Uh, David Offit, a well-known Brockton-based realtor, Century 21 Northeast, and David is very active in a, a number of organizations across the city. Uh, Maria Gomes uh, owns a business called Apollo Furniture on North Main Street. She's been there for about 25 years, well-established uh, Brockton business who I think can give us a number of different perspectives, uh, including uh, the Main Street perspective that we don't want to forget about. Uh, Sonny Aristamian uh, owns Sonny's Car Wash. I think everyone knows the one at the mall. Uh, but that's actually one of three businesses he owns here in the city of Brockton, uh, two car washes and a repair shop. And uh, I, I think all of these folks have great individual stories of success, but Sonny has certainly, as an immigrant business owner, built a very significant business presence uh, here in the city. And uh, Brian Drukas of Drukas Real Estate, and Brian has worked with many of you I know uh, in terms of uh, commercial real estate, and I think that he'll be a great sounding board of someone that works with developers, works with business owners on a daily basis. And that's certainly an angle we're also looking at too. What can we do better to attract small businesses to decide to select Brockton to open their new business in? And uh, what is helping us or hurting us in terms of businesses deciding to locate here in the city of Brockton? So uh, we're, we're very excited about uh, taking this new initiative. Uh, one of the first things we've decided to do is to build a database of all small businesses uh, in the city. That'll be a challenge for this summer. I think there are a number of databases of small businesses in the city, uh, but no one seems to be able to point me to one comprehensive one that would attempt to grasp all small businesses in the city. So I think we're, we're excited about the prospects and for everyone here in the room, 
I hope that you won't hesitate to reach out to us with your uh, thoughts and suggestions as what we can do better to make Brockton a home for small business. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Carpenter. So today, the Chamber and Bank of America are pleased to celebrate business achievement with the presentation of the 2018 Entrepreneur and Small Business of the Year Awards. We want to thank all of those who submitted nominations for these awards. We had a number of very strong candidates making this year's decision even more difficult. The nominating committee looked for companies that balance success with commitment to community. Each nominee is based, rate, rated based on five criteria, number of employees, staying power, growth, social responsibility, and innovation in their process or their product. To meet just a few of these criteria is a significant accomplishment. Now to assist with the presentation, I ask Paul Ignetti from Bank of America and Chamber President Chris Cooney to join me on the stage, as well as the mayor. The Entrepreneur of the Year Award recognizes the innovative individuals whose businesses have grown throughout through their commitment to their customers, their product, processes, and their community. The glasses again. Metro South Chamber and Bank of America Small Business Services are pleased to present the 2018 Entrepreneur of the Year Award to Shoveltown Brewery of Easton. <laughs> Just a little bit about our winner. Just about every home brewer's dream to open a brewery. When Frank Altieri's neighbor, Jim McSherry, introduced him to the art of creating the perfect home brew, Frank never imagined what the future would hold for the, new, the now co-owners of the Shoveltown Brewery. As their home brewing progressed, they sometimes discussed that it would be great to open a brewery in their hometown of Easton. They entered home brewing competitions and won first and second prizes. Then they entered a local craft beer festival, and again, their beer received great reviews and placed second. At that point, they thought it might be on to something and started a serious discussion about opening a brewery. They were both interested in having their own business that would blend their passion for brewing with education and their combined work experiences in larger companies. When asked about some of their biggest surprises that have been to date, Frank shared, and I quote, one of our biggest surprises has been that within six months of opening, we had to double the size of the brew house and our tap room to meet demand. We weren't brewing enough beer. We had to figure out how to balance production with demand and how we could produce and the amount of beer needed to sustain growth and grow the business. They've obviously kept up because their brewery is bustling with activity, private parties, and new customers weekly. The Metro South Chamber and Bank of America are proud to announce that Shoveltown Brewery of Easton is the 2018 Entrepreneur of the World. Thank you very much. Uh, it's quite an honor, uh, I have to admit. Um, I'm going to go off script just a minute here to, uh, to uh, really pick up on some points that Aaron brought up uh, in, in, at the beginning. When we first started this, uh, first started the brewery, it, it was uh, Jim and I, we were going to brew everything, we were going to serve every customer, we were going to clean every table ourselves. We quickly realized that we couldn't do it without a staff. And really, the staff of our brewery has really been one of the cornerstones of our success. Um, so let me make sure I got that. As, as you may know by now, I'm Frank Altieri, uh, one of the owners of Shoveltown Brewery. Uh, my business partner, Jim McSherry, was unable to make it today due to a prior commitment, but he wanted me to make sure I passed along uh, his appreciation for this award. Jim and I would like to thank the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and the, and the Selection Committee for uh, recognizing us for this prestigious award. We would also like to thank our families for their patience and support in allowing us, and particularly me, uh, a chance to pursue another one of my crazy dreams. Um, owning my own business has been something I had thought about for quite a while. I've always worked for a very large corporation, uh, 
about 35 years in the industry in electronics, electronics manufacturing, and I felt like, you know, there was something missing if I ended my career without uh, starting my own, my own company. Um, uh, <clears throat> Jim and I would like to uh, recognize our fantastic staff at Shoveltown Brewery and the, that work every day to provide exceptional experience for our customers. Without them, we would be really uh, lost. There are a number of others that I would like to thank for helping making Shoveltown Brewery a success, but I would be remiss in not mentioning the town of Easton and the town officials who supported us in getting us started. This ties in also what, with what Mayor Carpenter was saying. You, we need that support within the uh, government and within the community to, to be successful, so your, your efforts are, are right on target. Um, Connor Reed, who, who many of you may know, is a very young uh, town administrator, but at the time was the director of economic development. And Gary Anderson, the town planner, both of those individuals were instrumental in helping us uh, na navigate local requirements, which could seem very inundating to a, a new business trying to get started, and potentially even for an immigrant who's trying to come in and access the market. So any help that can be provided there is definitely appreciated. Uh, we feel fortunate for this support and the support of our community. Um, and we've heard stories from other breweries where local officials, the government, and community have been less welcoming to their business. And that, that really is a stifle for business, and I can't believe it happens. Um, when I look back on the days when Jim and I started by literally cooking beer on his, on his stovetop, uh, we never could imagine that Shoveltown Brewery would be as successful as it's become and that we would be here today accepting this fantastic recognition. When Jim and I were planning to open the business, we knew that a brew, uh, brewing great beer was just table stakes to get into the business. Um, uh, we were entering a fairly crowded market. In 2011, there were 45 breweries in Massachusetts, but by 2016, there were 110. In 2017, the year that we opened Shoveltown Brewery, another 29 breweries opened, and there's another 50 that could open in 2018. Some people ask me, do we think that the brewery market is oversaturated? And one of the things that I say is there's a pizza place on every corner. There could be a brewery in every town. And if you look at the statistics by the Brewers Association, Massachusetts has um, a less per capita brewery per, per people that are out there. So there's still opportunity for growth in Massachusetts. In Germany, for example, breweries are very locally centered. There's one in almost every neighborhood, and they're a meeting place for people to come to. That's what it's like at Shoveltown Brewery. You come to Shoveltown Brewery, we, we go out, Jim and I um, constantly go out into the crowd. We greet all of our, our, our customers that come in, and we make them feel special in our, in our environment. And that's why we think we've been so successful. Um, I learned that lesson from my father, who was um, part owner of a, of a restaurant, and he he would often lament to me that he he uh, the the owner of the restaurant was also the chef, but he was a very shy guy, and he would never come out to meet the the customers. And my father always said, people want to be recognized; they want to feel part of something. At Shoveltown Brewery, we, we make them feel part of the business. Um, let me see, I lost my place because I went off, <laughs> went off target. Um, despite the competition, we've been able to carve out a niche by producing a selection of great tasting beers, some of which you might be able to taste today, and um, providing uh, what we believe is exceptional customer service and a customer experience. We create a, a relaxing and comfortable environment, and we part of our mission statement has been to give back to the community. There hasn't been... Uh, a uh, community organization or a charity that's come through the doors and asked something for us that we haven't been able to at least help out with. Um, despite our achievements, we're not done yet. Uh, we have some exciting plans that you will hear about more in the next coming weeks. Those plans include a partnership with the Brockton Rocks, where we'll be, uh, Shoveltown beer will be served at the stadium. 
and a public-private partnership project that we've been working on with the Mass Development, the City of Brockton, its agencies and community groups to transform what's now a vacant lot in the heart of downtown Brockton on Main Street to a safe, fun, and vibrant outdoor space for building community. I, I, I want to say thanks again for your recognition of our efforts and contributions. And as we say at the brewery, grab a shovel, help build a brewery. Grab a shovel, help build a community. Thank you. The Small Business of the Year Award recognizes business leadership which has fostered company growth and created new jobs while contributing to the community. The 2018 Small Business of the Year Award is presented to Just Desserts Bakery and Cafe of Bridgewater. To make the presentation. And now to maybe say a few words about our honoree. How many people are able to turn a dream into reality, let alone a thriving business? That's what Lisa, Lisa I'm sorry, Lisa Lundin, I'm sorry, I've been talking to her. I know, well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Baker and cake artist has done an opening Just Desserts Bakery and Cafe. She took a hobby that used to keep her children and their friends occupied and turned it into a successful business. If only we could all be so talented at a skill that creates standing room only space during the morning hours and throughout the day, plus a bustling cake and bakery catering business. I think we can all agree, Lisa, you have made the right decision starting your business. Beyond the delicious and creative bakery items and cakes, Just Desserts is also known for their incredible service. Lisa prides herself on her rapport with her customers. Her staff marvels at her ability to remember everybody's name. When asked about her customers, Lisa says, and I quote her, I am so grateful for the community's response to our bakery. Our customers are like family, and I want to know each of them. She strongly believes that giving back to the community is part of her responsibility as a local business owner. She works with a variety of associations, from nonprofits to public safety, as well as youth organizations providing food and teaching as a way of paying it forward. Please join me in, once again in congratulating our 2018 Small Business of the Year recipient, Lisa Lundin of Just Desserts Bakery and Cafe. Thank you. So, um, Jim, thank you for giving such a lengthy speech. I, I wasn't planning on speaking for so long. And the more you talked, the more I thought, oh my God, he's making me look worse and worse. Um, I'd love to talk to people all day long, but the public speaking thing, it's not that bad. I'm just not used to it. Um, I wanted to thank my family, um, all of my friends, my employees. Oh, this is really an honor to receive this award. Um, it's funny, when we first decided, I, I had kind of pictured Bridgewater for our bakery. It reminded me a lot of where I grew up in the Bronx. And um, I would just drive through the center and think, wow, this is a great town for a bakery. And then we started working on the space. And we would bring trash out to the cars. And people would be stopped at the lights and be like, you're never going to survive. You know, there's no parking. It was like that movie, A Christmas Story. You'll shoot your eye out. There's no parking. You're never going to survive. That building's cursed, you know. And although the building may be cursed at times, um, you know, we've been hit by a track trailer, cars. Um, we, I feel like I made a good choice on the location. We love Bridgewater. Um, when we first opened, we had a lot of questions. People would come in and say, well, where do we park? And I would say to them, well, where did you park today? And they'd say, well, I parked over there. I'm like, well, that's where you park. When you come back, <laughs> park there again. You know? Or you could park across the street. I'll make sure they don't tow you out of Walgreens for the 15 minutes you're here. Um, so it's been quite an adventure. We've, I've learned a lot along the way. Um, as Erin said, a lot of times you just kind of start out and you don't think it through all the way, but it's kind of a learning process. I've met a lot of wonderful people, networked with a lot of wonderful business owners, um, and we love Bridgewater. So um, thank you all for this award. Appreciate it. Thank you.